Now, delighted to welcome Paul McGinley to the show, who I'm told is very shortly getting on a flight to Mexico, I presume, for the WGC. Paul, how are you doing? Yeah, that's it, Joe. Uh, it's not down for the food or the weather, unfortunately. It's down to, uh, yeah, my first one of the year with Sky. So I'm looking forward to it, seeing all the guys and, and getting stuck into it. Well, we know it's serious when Sky are bringing you along, uh, which is the point here. <laughs> we're, uh, we're into the heart it's of the so season now. We're into the heart of the season. So the Genesis Invitational... Uh, won by Adam Scott. Obviously, it had a brilliant field. Nine of the world's top ten there. Rory McIlroy very much in the hunt. Just an initial point to make for people who might have watched on Sunday because it was a re really entertaining uh, final round. We talk a lot about distance, but Tiger Woods made the point that Riviera, it was as firm on that Sunday as it ever is. And so it made for a brilliant challenge around the greens. I mean, it was Augusta-esque at times and it made for a great watch as well, which shows that course setup is all important when we're talking about getting the most from the game yeah you know i take that point joe and you know there's a lot of debate going on lately about uh where we're at with uh with driving distance and all those kind of things but you know what people forget is it's okay saying great setup yeah wonderful setup and it was a wonderful setup the problem is what happened if a deluge of rain came on wednesday mm. all the brilliant setup of firm greens and all that would have been you know, null and void. And that's the problem we've got with saying, oh, yeah, this is the way to fix uh, the issue with with technology is just make the, make everything firm. But that's OK until the deluge of rain comes. Um, and particularly the PGA Tour, it, it follows, you know, it plays in a lot of warm climates and they're very, um, you know, there's a real good high chance. And it happens a lot where there's a deluge of rain earlier in the week and the golf becomes very soft very quickly. So unless we come up with some kind of incredible technology that dries out a golf course really quickly, mm. that's not quite the answer. It's great if, if you're lucky and the weather stays good like it did in L.A. But if the rain comes, it's going to be a shootout again. No, that's a fair point. I was listening to Brandel Chambly. He was reacting to the distance report from the RNA and the USGA. And he was saying the biggest issue for him is course setup. He was saying that there is no punishment for wayward driving. You can just hit the ball as long as you want and gouge it out with a wedge and you're on the green. He said that's the biggest issue in golf. And he was absolutely against a, a rollback against the technology. Where are you in all this? Um, I see both sides of the debate, Joe. And I understand, you know, being involved now with the tour of board level and all the stuff that goes on, you know, when you look about the metrics and the numbers and potential lawyers and all the kind of stuff uh, that will go into this decision being made. Um, I, I, I'm quite firmly and I have been for quite a while on verification, which is two sets of, of regulations on equipment, uh, one for the professionals and one for the amateurs. I think the game is a very difficult one um, for amateurs in particular and people who don't have fast ball speeds. And I would like to see um, technology companies being allowed to make the game a little bit easier and the restrictions coming off them to do that. At the same time, um, I don't want to see professionals hitting the ball any further. They're absolutely maxed out at the moment. They're making a nonsense out of a lot of these courses when these courses are soft. Um, now, when they're firm like last week, that's great. And it's all of a sudden everybody forgets about the, the bomb and gouge kind of game. But uh, all you got to do is have one day of weather, as they say, and, and that's null and void. So I, I certainly, I don't know about a rollback. Uh, I think it might be very difficult to have a rollback in terms of technology, but certainly halt it where it is now and don't let it go any further for the bigger hitters where there's a huge reward if you've got a lot of ball speed. Okay. Uh, let's dig into the tournament then. So Adam Scott prevailed. I mean... <laughs> He turns 40 this year. He won the Australian PGA in December, the PGA Championship in Australia. Then he took some time off, hadn't really played, and came back here at the weekend and broke a near four-year PGA uh, drought. And he's back inside the world's top 10 now. He's only won one major. Uh, he said himself the aim absolutely has to win two. His talent has merited to uh, putting woes aside at times. Yeah, I think no doubt about that. He's a very elegant player. I remember when he burst on the scene, um, I think it might have been Peter Laurie actually who, who played with him um, in uh, in Scotland in Glen Eagles and he came off and he said I've just played with the greatest player I've ever played in my life and, and, and he just ripped that course apart and he's only just turned pro he swung the club like Tiger Woods he played like Tiger Woods who was in his prime around that time in the 90s and um, you know, he, he's, he's been blessed with, it, with a wonderful game and it's never left him yes the putting has left him um, and I think he'd be first to admit his desire has left him as well too uh, but he certainly uh, seems to have got back on the horse again. I, I thought he was a bit disappointing in the President's Cup, uh, being Australian. Um, you know, he didn't win the singles matches when it was really crucial. But since then, um, he's certainly won the PGA the week after, as you say, in Australia, and then came back and won against a very strong field this week in uh, 
in LA. So, yeah, it'd be no surprise if he were to pop up and win a second major championship, and his career certainly deserves it. Uh, let's talk about Rory then, who uh, went to world number one, obviously, in the build up to the tournament. Uh, in, since Port Rush, he has played 12 events, he's had 10 top 10s, 8 top 5s, and 2 wins since Port Rush. Uh, there is, to use the word actually he used himself in the third interview with Paul Kimmage at the weekend, intensity. Uh, there has been an intensity about McElroy in particular for the last six, seven months. Oh, I think there's no doubt about that, Joe. You know, I, I've talked with you over the years about pointy elbows, and this is exactly what I mean. Um, we haven't seen this for a while from McElroy. Uh, we do see it now. Um, he's got his bite back. He's got his competitors back. He's got that edge. He's got that little bit of narkiness about him, which is when he plays his best. It's He's got that edge about when he, he's he got a point to prove, you know, when he's on the edge and he's kind of a little bit pissed off. That's when he, that's when he seems to play his best. And that combined with a real upturn in, in, his, in his putting statistics um, is a reason why all of a sudden he's gone on this surge of incredible play over the last uh, number of months, as you say. Because he certainly, I mean, there were very interesting conversations and he talked a lot about his mindset with Paul Kimmage in the Sunday Independent. And he certainly rails against the notion that, you, you know, you, you take any heed of anyone else or you worry about points to prove or you play in any way uh, angry or with a certain narkiness or edge. And yet, post Port Rush, you feel like he has been out to prove a point. And the Kepka rivalry seems to have uh, stirred him. Again, he doesn't want to pitch it as a rivalry, but we even saw the difference between when he played in, with Kepka in Memphis versus a couple of weeks later. There was a difference in his demeanour. And uh, that is certainly there. And, and as you, your phrase was pointy elbows for a long time. Um, that is there now. There is, there is a difference there, even though he might not exactly want to buy into it publicly. Absolutely, no doubt. I, 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 I see with my own eyes. I know him. I, I observe him. I watch him, and he's definitely got an edge. He got a bite about his competitiveness that he didn't have, um, you know, eighteen months ago mm. or a year ago, Joe. And it's quite clear to see. Uh, in terms of his interviews with Paul, you know, is he is he playing a game there? We don't know. Is he? We all know he he does make a lot of contradictory comments. Um, he says one thing and then does another, and yeah. and. and you know, I, I think that's part of the competitiveness. I mean, Tiger Woods is like that. You know, listen to Brooks Kepka, He's a little bit like that too. They say one thing, but actually you look at their behaviors and it's slightly different. And that's all part of being a competitor. It's not only because that's a criticism. I think it's not letting your guard down. It's it's portraying something, um, portraying, portraying an image. And, and, and uh, Tiger Woods has always been the best at it. Um, mm. I mean, look at the way he hid last year. Everybody kept saying when he wasn't playing very well after the Masters, are you injured? Is a back sore? What's going on? No, no, I'm absolutely not injured. There's nothing wrong with me. Everything's fine. I'm just, you know, just not going playing particularly well. And all of a sudden, then, in the end of the season, oh, I've just had a knee operation and all of a sudden he comes back and he's a different player. So obviously then he said, yeah, I was carrying it all season. So, you know, what do you believe and what do you not believe, Joe? Um, yeah. and well, I, well I, don't, but, I don't believe for a second when he heard that Brooks Kepka texted his friends to say, I'm going to crush him. And then Julie did in Memphis. I don't believe for a second that that did not irk McElroy massively. Yeah, and you know, and it should do. Um, as a competitor, that's, that's the kind of reaction you want from McElroy. That's when he's at his best, Joe. Um, when he has a point to prove. Now, if he doesn't want to say it publicly, that's fine. There's no problem with that. Um, you know, Jack Nicholas uh, certainly wasn't one who came out making grand statements. You don't have to be uh, a Roy Keane type of figure to make big statements and, and then follow through. You, there's different ways of, of getting the end result, and that depends on your personality. And I don't think Rory is a confrontational personality. It's not his it's not his way, but mm. there's a quiet determination about him when he's at his best. And I think that's what we're seeing at the moment, and that's what came through in, in Paul's, uh, in Paul's, image, in, in Paul's um, uh, articles with him. So uh, let's play the critic then, the role of the critic, because that, let's, let's hone in on where he was. He got himself into a brilliant position in this tournament, had played some great golf on the Saturday evening. He gets to the fifth hole with Adam Scott, and if people didn't see it, this was the kind of key moment, the key juncture. Uh, he emerged with a triple bogey seven. Uh, Adam Scott had a double bogey. Both of them went long. McElroy said he got a flyer. They were long. The green is an upturned saucer. They both failed to get their ball back on. Uh, I guess a cardinal sin, but it's not easy out there for sure. When McElroy did get his ball back on to 20 feet, he rolled the putt up to 2 feet 11 inches. And then the, the definite cardinal sin was he missed that putt and he followed it up with a bogey. So Scott, by comparison got his ball back on, made the double bogey and followed up with a birdie. And suddenly that's a three-shot swing and it's really difficult for McElroy to get back into the tournament at that point. 
So uh, that is what will uh, frustrate him. Uh, give us your analysis of what happened there. Yeah, I think you've summed it up exactly what happened there, Jim, um, Joe. Um, and, but then to add a little point on top of that, he then stood up uh, dishevelled on the next tee in the par three and hit a really poor tee shot into mm. position Z and made another bogey. So he really dropped four shots over over that mistake that he made with the chip shot. Um, um, one thing we've learned from McIlroy over the years, and one thing that's very clear, he's very, very good at learning from his mistakes. And um, that was an unfair error. Um, he beat himself uh, around that time. Uh, he made some mistakes around that hole. And he'll know, sitting on his plane going back to wherever he was, uh, on Sunday night or whether he's going down to Mexico, uh, he'd be saying, you know what, I cost it because I got greedy. I should have just taken my medicine. And, and, and you know, who's to say that maybe comes the Masters and that same situation comes up and you chip on, you make your bogey and move on, and that's the lesson to be learned. And um, everybody makes mistakes playing this game. There's no mm. doubt. I mean, I'm certainly not one to tell him or any, any of us. We, we all know he's the first to recognize that he's made a massive mistake there by taking a triple bogey at, at a very... At a very um, condensed leaderboard you know you can't afford to give the guys that many um that many shots in one go um and then to follow it on we've seen McIlroy come back from these things and he tried he'd really good opportunities on seven eight nine and ten all for birdies and missed all four of them um i know he birdied 11 and kind of there but he was never really in contention yeah. and he wasn't able to exert pressure on scott around that time when scott was doing the opposite because he had that little bit of a leeway over um, over McElroy, uh, he was able to hold a few putts for par and keep that kind of distance between him and off he went uh, with that comfort in, in, into winning. And and that's the cut and thrust of competitive golf. Um, you know, McElroy certainly, that mistake cost him. Um, I think without that triple bogey, he probably wouldn't have won that tournament because, as I say, he's in a great competitive mindset at the moment and I think he would have enjoyed the cut and thrust mm. uh, of the back nine holes if he was on the lead or just a shot off it. Yeah, I think we saw the frustration at one stage when he gave the pin a smack later on yeah, in the round. Because he knew, I mean, he knew, world number one, like the best player in the field, if we're being honest about it. And, and like that tournament was his for the taking. So, he, you know, he, he knew and we'll, I, I suspect we might, may see a response in Mexico. I, I, I think so, Joe. You know, and I'm a great believer that, you know, in a competitive situation like that, a match play in particular, um, uh, and particularly when you're somebody like Rory McIlroy, that everybody's looking out for you, are all looking for your name on the top yeah. of the leaderboard. The others play as good as you let them. Um, and, and that mistake from Rory, not long did it hurt a scorecard, but it gave a huge amount of spirit to the other guys to think, oh, Bob, I've got a little bit of a, a push on, on McElroy now. Um, and and he, didn't, he didn't crush them. He didn't keep them down. And I think if he had kept them down, the competitors for a few more holes, he could have then uh, rode out to victory. But look, it's hard to be critical. As you say, just the stats you gave there earlier, you know, yeah. in the last nine, seven top fives in the last nine events that he's played. I mean, this is this is... This is the best golf I've ever seen McElroy play. Mm. You're looking at his statistics. I've been delving into the statistics quite a lot in the last month and getting prepared for the season. I mean, he's off the charts how well statistically he is. You know, just very quickly going through yeah, his stats please. last year in the PGA Tour. I mean, number one, um, number one in, in, in basically ball strike and tee to green. Number one in driving. Twelfth in approach. 19th and scrambling around the green and then hugely as we said earlier and alluded to his putting has gone from 179th two years ago um on the pga tour to 24th last year mm. um and when you put all those together and that little bite that he's got come back competitively that's why we're seeing the results we are the only guy in world golf who's close to him statistically at the moment is justin thomas uh, on a consistent level mm. um the rest of them even john ram you know are quite a ways behind because rory's uh, standards have been so high yeah and a word on Tiger Woods then, if, if people didn't see this, uh, geez, he looked tired on the Sunday. Like he was, he was at one stage just all arms slashing, get me out of here. I, I, it's rare you'd see anyone, a professional golfer certainly, uh, that tired playing golf. And he was speaking with uh, your former colleague, Henny Zoll, on uh, Golf TV afterwards. And if he looked uh, light to people's eye, he said himself he was incredibly light, way too light from his point of view. He was going to go and try and put on a bit of, bit of weight. Uh, and he pretty much admitted that he was just wrecked, tired. Yeah, again, I take it all with a pinch of salt, Joe. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> I, I honestly do. You know, yeah, he was hosting last week and, and it, it obviously took a lot out of him. Um, but looking at him earlier in the season and looking at him in the first round, how well he played. I watched a lot of LA last week. I know that course really well and mm. played that tournament a number of times. I know the course inside out. And, and that's why I was really intrigued to watch it. 
Uh, he looked as he looked fantastic, particularly the first round that he played. Yeah. He's looked very good early season this year as well. Um, and obviously finishing Japan at the end of last year, he looked great. So for some reason, all of a sudden, he, he was out of gas last week. What that reason was, I don't know. And we'll never find out because Tiger won't tell us, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, not a, <laughs> it's unlikely. Uh, Brand, Brandel Chambly says Woods is swinging the club now better than at any stage in his career. You know, he's, he compares it with, uh, what was it, 2003, the Farmers Insurance Open, he made the point that's when he thought Woods was swinging the club at his most audaciously perfect. He said so, a, a touch of the speed is gone, but in terms of uh, the positions and just the swing on the whole, he said Woods now, without a coach, is swinging the club as well, if not better than ever at any stage in his career. Do you go along with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm listen. I'm not a connoisseur of the golf swing. I mean, I I, I know it in general, um, but I, I'm I wouldn't be a, as versed on the golf swing and studied it as much as Brandel would have done. And, and I'd certainly take his word from it. All I can talk about is the results. Mm. And and looking, um, unfortunately, he didn't play a lot of golf last year on the PGA Tour. So as a result, he didn't count in a lot of statistic categories. But on a week to week basis, as I look as how he's played, um, his iron play in particular. Um, is absolutely fabulous. Uh, his ability to work the ball both ways um, has always been a strong part, part of his game, and he certainly has got that again. Uh, I don't think he puts as well as he used to, to be quite honest. Um, I think he hits the ball uh, straighter than he used to, but I don't think he puts as well. Um, that's what statistics are showing me, the bits that I've seen of him. Mm. Um, but yeah, look, he's, he's great. He's box office. We love having him at the top of the leaderboard. We love having him back in the mix again. Um, and... Um, you know, Augusta, as we all know, as they call it, Bernard Langer, remember saying to me years and years ago, it's a sh second shot golf course. It's, mm. it's Everybody talks about the putting, but if you put your put your approach shots in the right side of the hole, now you can be aggressive with the putter. If you put them on the wrong side of the hole, it's all about defensive with the putter. And, and I think that's why he won the Masters last year, because his approach play, he was number one in strokes game approach. And, and you look at the guys who've played well the last three or four years, Winning around Augusta, it's strokes gained approach, i.e. match play. That's where they have led that category. Uh, and that's a huge correlation between that category and winning around Augusta. As you mentioned, you're on the European Tour board. I know you love the traditions of the game and the history of the game. The Premier League golf proposals, uh, if people haven't caught these, uh, 48 of the best golfers in the world is the uh, proposal anyway that they would leave the PGA Tour, they would leave the European Tour effectively. There would be a Formula One-esque uh, schedule. It seems that there is serious money involved from the Middle East, Saudi money involved. A lot of people picked up on the fact that Tiger Woods didn't shut the door on it outright uh, last week. I'm sure it helps him in a bit of leverage with the PGA Tour maybe, but certainly he didn't shut the door on it regardless. Uh, what's the feeling out there? How realistic a, a threat, I suppose, is this to the natural order as we know it? Um, I've got to be careful what I say here, but I, I certainly comment on it, Joe. Um, I think um, I really don't think it's going to happen. I'll be really, really amazed if it's going to happen. And, and, and the reason why I say that more than anything is the system is not broken. I mean, the guys on the, on the tour are making so many millions. They've got so many millions in their pension funds. Um, the new TV deal is about to, be, about to be signed. And by all accounts, the prize money to FedEx TPC, all those prize monies are going to have a huge escalation again. So, you know, when somebody comes in and 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 uh, and tries to shake up a sport or, or do something very radically uh, different, that's fine and good if this current system is broken. And I don't see the PGA Tour stroke European Tour dynamic as the two leaders in professional golf as particularly broken. You know, we're one very successful in Europe in terms of the race to Dubai. Rolex have resigned again. We've got a lot of uh, things lined up for this year. Um, you know, the Ryder Cup is flying as, as it always does. The same with the PGA Tour. So I, I don't see it for that reason. Um, and then on the other moral reasons, I, I really don't see the likes of Tiger, Rory, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Koepka, these really top players turning the back, uh, particularly on the history of the PGA Tour mm. and indeed the European Tour at a different level and the history of these events and the history of Ben Hogan and the history of Jack's Memorial event and Bay Hill with Arnold Palmer and all of those things. I, I really can't see them doing for moral reasons as well because it's not like they're broke and it's not like they're not making money. I mean, you take the dynamic in the ladies' game where the European ladies' tour has just been overtaken by the, by the PGA Tour, uh, by the LPGA Tour. And, and you can understand why because the European ladies' tour was broken. They had no money. Um, you know, we're losing tournaments left, right and centre. And, you know, they're on their last legs. And that's when takeovers happen. So I really don't see it happening but look 
I've been amazed in a number of things that have happened. I'm surprised it's got as far as it has. Mm. Um, there's a lot of traction out there. There's a lot of, obviously, money um, behind it. Um, a lot of players are engaging with them. Um, and it'd be interesting to see what the shakeup is going to be. But in my view, I'll be really surprised uh, if they pull it off. I think uh, I think the PGA Tour are way, way too powerful to to let uh, somebody else come in and, and um, cut their grass to to, yeah. so to speak. Okay. Um, so, look, you're off to Mexico. I see that uh, Brooks Kepka, who, to be fair, is nursing his recovery from a serious knee injury, but Kepka, Tiger Woods, probably physically as well, didn't, didn't want the trek down. Uh, Patrick Cantlay, Justin Rose, Ricky Fowler, Tony Finau, Henrik Stenson, all absent at the WGC this week. Is this a consequence of the incredibly tight schedule, the majors all condensed, the Olympics on the horizon? Is that what's going on here? Um, yeah, it's a number of two things, Joe. Um, it, it's first of all, um, all those things that you said, the condensed schedule, there's no doubt, put more pressure on the guys. And secondly, they're making so much money in the other events that they play in. There's seven to $10 million tournaments left, right and center. TPC is going to go over 10 million this year in a month's time uh, in terms of prize money. That they're not really forced to do it. Um, you know. And also the world rankings actually suits them. If you don't you know, with the world rankings, people who don't know, it's, it's basically the number of points you make over two years divided by the number of tournaments. So the less tournaments you play, you don't get rewarded for playing lots and lots of tournaments. Mm. So, you know, they're all mindful of that as well, too. So there's a number of dynamics, dynamics going on here. And like we spoke about the Irish Open last year, um, even for these world golf events, Joe, you know, the, the, if, you get, if you get some of the top players, um, that's a very successful new dynamic in, in terms of how, how what, what, what a current field is in a major event. It was very different last week in L.A. Uh, I think that's because the golf course was so good. Mm. I think that's because Tiger was hosting. Um, and I think it suited a lot of people's schedule. Um, but in general, um, that's, that's what we're faced with now when we come to these big major events, get three or four of the top 10 players in the world, maybe five or six if it comes to a world event. Um, and a number from the sort of 10 to 20. And, and, and that's kind of what we're faced with. That's what it is, because there's so much choice out there for these players, particularly in this condensed schedule. OK, listen, thanks so much for your time. Uh, you'll get this on YouTube, by the way, if you didn't see it. Did you see Padraig Harrington being interviewed by Tommy Tiernan over the weekend? No, I didn't. I look forward to seeing that. I, I really like Tommy Tiernan. He's great stuff. He, he is truly amazing. And uh, I think for the first time anyway that I can remember, uh, Padraig Harrington in an interview is asked, what is the meaning of love? So if that doesn't uh, <laughs> direct you to oh. it, I don't know I what will. <laughs> I, 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 think... I bet your part didn't get stuck for words, though, did he? No, no, yeah, he came. I mean, he had, he had thought about it. You know, he was ready to go. He'll, he'll go wherever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen, enjoy Mexico. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Joe. Cheers. All the best. Bye.